In this episode of Woodlands on the Web, we'll be looking at the kinetics of iodine clock reactions. So the iodine clock reaction is a really classic reaction to look at kinetics because it doesn't change color until all of one of the reactants is used up. So when that happens, that allows you to really easily measure the amount of time it takes and therefore figure out the rate at which that reaction occurs. As you can see here in just a second, um, the color change is very quick and very dramatic. And again, that allows you to record the amount of time that it took for that particular reaction to end. So here's the actual reaction mechanism, and it's described further in this brief paragraph below. The most important thing is that these are the two reactants that we're mixing together. We're mixing um, a source of iodide with a source of S2O8 but we're not actually seeing or recording the reaction until the third step happens when we form this blue-black complex. So according to the reaction mechanism's description, it says that reaction two has to happen in its entirety before it's possible for reaction three to happen. Okay, so based on that, that means we're looking at the degradation of this I, um, iodide complex. And so in order to see it over here, um, what we're looking at is that with this multi-step reaction profile, we're going to be looking at reaction one as the slow step and reaction two as the fast step. So we're going to be basing our reaction rates essentially on reaction one because it has to happen before we can actually see the color change. So upon running the sim, um, these were the numbers that I got as far as uh, the amount of time it took for the reaction to change. Your numbers should be fairly similar, but it's okay if they're a little bit different. Um, I'm just going to work through trial one to show you how to get the, the different concentrations and average rates, and then we'll finish this up with looking at the overall rate law for this experiment. Okay, so first of all, we have to look at the concentration of each of our reactants. And it's important to remember that we have a concentration of the solution given to us initially, but we also have a 100 milliliter volume total. Okay, so that's the total of the entire reaction itself with all of the things that were put into that reaction vessel. So in the case of the Ki, or I should say the iodide, in trial one, it was initially a one molar solution, but we had 12 milliliters of that out of the total 100 milliliter reaction vessel. So because of that, then the concentration I'm going to be putting down in my table is the concentration of iodide in that entire reaction vessel which if I multiply that out is 0.12. These are both going to be molarity, so I'm just going to label my square of that. Okay, so I'll do the same thing for the S2O8. In that particular case, we had a 0.1 molar solution to start with, and we had 30 milliliters out of the total 100 milliliter volume. So in the entire reaction vessel itself, my concentration of S2O8 was 0.03 molar. I would actually suggest that you pause here and figure out the rest of your concentrations because you're going to need those to move forward with calculating the average rates in just a moment. Okay, so go ahead and pause now, please. So now that we have some concentrations, let's look back at the reaction mechanism one more time to see what are we actually observing when we see the color change. Okay, so the fact that I circled the iodine or iodide ions, excuse me, in the first and the third reaction. So those basically don't get completely used up. But the thing that you do see disappear entirely is your S2O8. So when we see that blue-black complex form, that means all of our S2O8 has been used up and converted and been converted to that starch complex. So we're going to be basing our um, our rates on the S2O8 concentration because that's the one that we know is zero when the reaction ends and when we, when we wrote down our time. So looking at part C, finding our average rate at room temperature, remember that that's looking at the change in concentration over the time that passes 
And again, we're going to be using our S208 as our thing that we're observing um, in real time with the times that we've written down. So in order to find my average rate, um, for this first trial, I'm going to be using the concentration of S208, so the 0.03 molar, divided by the amount of time that passed, which was 18 seconds for that particular um, temperature. All right, so when I get that value, I get 0 0.0017, and my concentration for all of these values is going to be molarity per second, okay, because these are rates that make sense. All right, so if you would, go ahead and calculate the rest of your average rates based on using the S208 concentration over the amount of time that passed for the different trials and different temperatures. So please go ahead and hit pause before you move on. Okay, if you've done your calculations correctly, you should have some numbers in the same ballpark as me. It's okay if they're not exactly the same. Again, you might have had some different time points. Um, for when you stopped the stopwatch, but it should be something kind of close. So what we're going to do now to finish out looking at this experiment is to decide what order of reaction is applicable for each of the two reactants and therefore also what is the overall order of the reaction. We can also calculate K once we figure that stuff out. Okay, so let's first start with iodide. So I've been using pink for the iodide. And so again, I'm wanting to use a place where the iodide concentration doubles, preferably, because doubling is the easiest thing to find, as compared to the S208 staying constant. So I'm going to be looking at trials one and two for the iodide order of reaction. So based on this, if I compare my two rates, it shouldn't matter which trial I use, it should be true for all um, three of the different temperature points, but when I divide 0 0.0017 by 0 0.00083, that's going to come out to be roughly two, okay? So if I'm saying that the concentration of the iodide doubles, okay, so it doubles when I'm at a certain order n, and my average rate doubles overall, then n must equal 1, which means this is a first order reaction with respect to the iodide. Okay, so basically, because there's a direct correlation between the average rate and between the concentration, it, it increases by the same magnitude each time, then this is a first order reaction. All right, so now let's look at the S208. So we want to find where the concentration of S208 doubles, but the iodide is constant. So we're going to look at trials one and trial three in this case. And again, any temperature, it shouldn't matter, but I'm going to be using um, those two trials and ignoring trial two because the concentration of iodide change and that adds another confounding variable. Okay, so if I use the concentration of S208 doubling by some number M, then that, if I divide those numbers, is going to equal something other than 2. So if I say 0 0.0017 divided by 0 0.00042, that's actually going to give me 4. Okay, so therefore the letter for the exponent, or I should say the exponent itself, is going to be 2 to the second, which means this is second order with respect to S208. Okay, so let's summarize that into a overall rate law, and then you can calculate K based on the things that we've already learned. So having this as our summary statement or our determination of order, and again, these numbers or these letters that you use don't matter. You just have to <clears throat> recognize that the exponents could be different, and in this case, they are. So if I'm writing my overall rate law expression for this particular reaction, my rate is going to be equal to some constant K times the concentration of iodide ions raised to the power of 1 because it's first order with respect to iodide, and it's also going to be based on the concentration of S2O8 that I use, 
but that's going to be squared because it's raised to the second power. It's a second order um, reaction with respect to S2O8. Okay, so just to be clear, my overall order of reaction is third order because I have um, a reactant with a, an understood one, you wouldn't have to write that, and a two, one plus two is three, therefore my overall reactions order is third order. And based on that information, you can then solve for K by using one of the trials and one of the particular temperatures, and you would be putting the rate over your concentrations in that case. Um, so just be careful that when you're doing that, that you do not forget to square the S2O8 concentration and that essentially the denominator portion is the, this quantity put together. Okay, so based on that, you should be able to now find the value of K and that will finish out this particular assignment. So that's it for this episode of Woodlands on the Web, Iodine Clock Reactions Edition. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something.